I remember when the riots started and the burnings started in 1967. Recalling America's summer of love and outrage. It's been 50 years. You know, how have things changed or not changed? And we're inventors, we're innovators. Um, we like to think outside the box, but we don't do that very much in our politics anymore. Minnesota State Representative Aaron Murphy hopes to be our next governor. This is Democratic Visions. Here's Tim O'Brien. Last November, State Representative Aaron Murphy became the first DFLer to officially enter the race to become Minnesota's next governor. Governor Mark Dayton is not seeking re-election, and you are seeking to be the, come, the, woman, the first woman governor in the state of Minnesota also, are you not? It would make me the first woman and the first nurse. That's very nice. Aaron has served as House Majority Leader and won her sixth House term representing House District 64A. That's St. Paul, Marion Park, McAllister, and the Groveland neighborhoods. Welcome to Democratic Visions. Thank you very much. Now, somebody that's coming off of six terms in the legislature knows how that place works for sure. Tell us, what, what do you think about the last session of the legislature that had like a 75-hour overtime provision? I'm very frustrated uh, with the way things ended in this last legislative session. Um, it's the third in a row where we ended poorly, not getting our work done, um, and really showing Minnesotans uh, the way not to uh, conduct ourselves in a legislative session. And, and for our audience, uh, that uh, these legislatures being run by the Republicans these days, is it not? It is. Now, but I do, I do note that uh, while you were in the loyal opposition, there were some measures that the Republicans were promoting that did not get passed or got vetoed by Governor Dayton. Do you, uh, can you elaborate on some of those that were, we'll call them near misses for the state of Minnesota? The governor in this session used his power to convey to the Republicans the things he would or wouldn't sign. Uh, and despite that, there were a number of provisions in the last 75 hours, as you say, uh, that were embedded in those pieces of legislation. Policy provisions. Policy provisions in the budget bills. They were extraneous. They didn't need to be there. We should do better than that for the people of Minnesota. We saw too many things passing through. We saw too much les legislation coming to us without a proper airing. Uh, too many things happening uh, behind closed doors without the public scrutiny, without the legislature's scrutiny, other than the legislative leadership. And Governor Dayton did a very good job of trying to stop as much of that as he could. Um, but there were pieces that did get through, things that I um, am very concerned about for the future of the state of Minnesota. Well, as governor, you'll be able to uh, rectify that, presumably. That's right. Now, one of the big situ one of the big things we were dealing with is the uh, so-called budget surplus, which I think amounted to about $1.65 billion. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, uh, some $300 million finally made it for tax cuts and uh, 350, give or take, went to roads and bridges. Have I stated that correctly? Actually, the tax bill cost Minnesotans about $600 million. So that's just for, and that's just for the next two years, is it not correct? Yep, and it grows a little bit into the out years. You know, when Governor Dayton ran for governor back in 2010, he ran saying he wanted to raise taxes on the top 2% of earners and then balance the budget. And we did that in 2013 and 14. And so for the most, most of my tenure as a legislator, I have been participating, setting budgets when we've had deficits. Um, and after we st sturdily balanced the budget in 13 and 14, we've seen modest surpluses uh, in the state's budget, which means that we have a shot at actually planning for our future. Mm -hmm. And if you look ahead, we do have some challenges in Minnesota that well, we should tackle. Well, besides that, the economy rolls up and down. It absolutely does. And so uh, the tax bill that the Republicans insisted on um, is very expensive, and I would expect, and uh, you know, state authorities are already suggesting that in the next biennium, or the one after that, we will start to see deficits again, which means that we have to put on hold planning for our future to fix that problem. And it's why I would have vetoed the bill um, if I'd been the governor, and you know, the governor had to consider all his options, and he took a different path, but that tax bill is too expensive for the people of Minnesota. Now, I know that you were at the Minneapolis City Convention last Saturday, because I was there too. Yeah. Uh, Minneapolis uh, uh, would have been uh, stopped at the gate if the preemption bill that the Republicans were pushing had uh, passed into law. Isn't that correct? Local units of government are elected by Minnesotans um, to set policies for their cities, their counties, their townships. Right, and they're close to the ground, so to speak. They are, and they're sent there by the people to do a job. And this year, the legislature took up a very serious consideration on limiting what those local elected officials could do or not do 
I, I oppose that. And they wanted to stop local units of government from setting any policy that had to do with wages or workplace. And I think that's wrong. I don't think that the legislature should be in the business of limiting locally elected officials duly sent to do the work of the people. The other thing, and there's millions of uh, issues that came up during this last session, but the one that I took to heart was uh, the fact that the so-called provisional ballot measure promoted by Minnesota Voters Alliance, certainly a s special interest group, lost. And someone, maybe not you, but someone said that was a bill where it was a solution in search of a problem. <laughs> I'm assuming that you opposed the passage of that measure also. We see all over the country and in the Minnesota legislature efforts to try and limit uh, people's access to the ballot box. Um, we saw that with the voter ID ballot initiative back in 2012, which Minnesotans defeated, and smartly so. We should make it as easy as possible and as reliable as possible because that is our power to set our future. And that provisional balloting uh, initiative was one to limit people's access to the ballot box. And I strongly oppose that. A real important issue out our way, and this is suburban Twin Cities, is light rail. The Republicans, uh, uh, that's anathema to them, to say the least. What's your position on light rail and the extension of the Southwest light rail uh, system? I support it. Um, I support the, the building out of transit, not just in the Twin Cities metro area, but all across the state of Minnesota. And when we think about how people are living, uh, especially people who are aging, uh, in our big, tall state, and in some places, sparsely populated state, transit's going to grow more and more important for us. Uh, I was in Grand Rapids uh, a few weeks ago and met with the head of the Chamber of Commerce there. His office is right behind the new uh, candy store and ice cream shop in the depot, and you should go if you get the chance. I get up there once in a while. It's a beautiful uh -huh. spot. And he said, we need transit in the Twin Cities area so I can, and the businesses that I represent, uh, can get their goods and services through the Twin Cities. It's too congested right now. It's unreliable. You need transit. We need transit. That's right. And the Republicans have chosen that issue to drive a political wedge uh, by geography, um, by saying, you know, someone's getting something that somebody else is not, instead of saying, and the right question for us is, how do we build the future's transportation, the state's future transportation system to meet the economy of our future and to meet the way of life of the people who live here, and in a way that attracts people to come and live here and continue to grow the state of Minnesota? No, I read, uh, Aaron, that. Uh, you didn't really uh, stand behind the governor on this issue on the strict ban of uh, issuing driver's license to immigrants uh, who are living in the country illegally. Can you explain that why you would take issue with the governor's position in that regard? And I know he didn't take it. He, yeah. he didn't want to take it, but it was part of a larger bill that he eventually signed. So in 2014, um, in the summer of 2014, I spent an afternoon in a church in North Minneapolis. It was a Latino church. Um, and listen to the stories of people who live and work in Minnesota and what it meant for them if they didn't have access to a driver's license. And I gave my word on that day that I would support the effort to make sure that we were able to issue driver's licenses to Minnesotans who are not documented here. Here's the practical reason why I think it's important. If you have a driver's license, it means you have insurance. And if you get into a car accident and you don't have insurance, the person whose car you hit is then stuck with that bill. Mm -hmm. And if there's insurance, there's a means to cover that. Uh, but there's also, you know, the more moral perspective, right? The people who are here and working um, who can't get documented because the Congress hasn't acted. Here, working, and paying taxes. And paying taxes, right? They are contributing to our society, and they want to. And we understand, uh, if you look at uh, the economy in greater Minnesota in particular, a lot of our industries, especially agriculture, is a reliant upon uh, people who are coming from other parts of the world and, and working in our communities. No doubt. Um, they are worried every day about getting behind the wheel of a car and getting stopped and picked up and sent home, especially since Donald Trump has been elected. So until the Congress is willing to step up and do the job that they need to do to make immigration work again for this country, I think local units of government and states are going to have to tackle that issue instead. I think it's a piece of policy that is gaining bipartisan support here in the state of Minnesota. Both Republicans and Democrats support that idea, and I think it will eventually become law. Our producer, Jeff Strait, gathered a few questions for you from voters, from folks that he knows, 
Some are on tapes, others are sent by email. We're going to bundle the healthcare questions together. The first question came by email from Anne, one of your 64A constituents, and I'll read it. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read three questions, and then I'm going to uh, see if you can remember each question and give me an answer. <laughs> it's All a right. test. All right. <laughs> I'll do my best. Here's the question. As a registered nurse, we've established that, who teaches nursing at St. Catharines, what are your thoughts on stabilizing the individual health care market and keeping premiums affordable for all? The second question comes from Joan in Eden Prairie. Um, the young people that I talk to are very clear that universal health care is the way to go. I'm wondering what your take is on that, especially coming from a nursing background. And finally, a question from Sarah Minnetonka. So I'm fairly young. Uh, there's a lot of talk about single-payer health care. Uh, what will you be doing as governor to carry Minnesota through? You know, as a nurse and now as a policymaker, uh, it is my first goal to make sure that people who are sick get health care. Uh, and the rest of what we do should follow that principle. And when I think about the way we have constructed our health care financing system, Unfortunately, it is people who are sick that are often the ones that are on the outside of the care delivery system or out of the payment system because they're the ones that carry the risk. And that's what we saw happen in the individual market. People who had been in a self-selected pool of people who were cut out of insurance because we used to allow insurance companies to deny people mm -hmm. coverage. They were in a pool um, constructed just for that purpose. And when we passed the Affordable Care Act and said insurance companies have to accept people with pre-existing conditions, people that used to be in MCHA, the Comprehensive Health Assessment Pool, moved <coughs> into the individual market. Uh, and there were more people in that pool that were sick than the pool could afford. Costs went up. Yep. So that's what happened in that individual market. Uh, I am a supporter of single payer. I'm a supporter John of- John Marty's bill? I'm an author of John Marty's bill. Um, but I also think that we should use the tool of Minnesota Care. When I was first working for the Minnesota Nurses Association 25 years ago, Minnesota led the way in the passage of Minnesota Care, creating coverage for people who worked but didn't have coverage in their employer. Uh, it is a stable, trusted that health care Gov coverage Governor program. Governor Carlson, wasn't it? It was Governor Carlson. He vetoed it in the first year, signed it into the second year because it came with a dedicated funding source, the provider tax. Okay. People have been getting their coverage through Minnesota Care for years, and I think we should open it up for purchase for anybody, not just people in the individual market. We should use it as a public option. And I think we have to get to work building the infrastructure to create networks that support uh, people in our public programs. When you look at what Medica did in this last year, stepping away from their contract for medical assistance in Minnesota Care, I think the health plans in Minnesota are sending a really clear signal about their indecision about continued participation in our public programs. And if they're not going to participate and share their networks, then we're going to have to build our own um, without the health plans. So we have to build that infrastructure. I think that's important. So as the governor of the state of Minnesota, I would allow people to buy into Minnesota Care full price, but it would still be more affordable than often their employer-based mm -hmm. coverage. Mm -hmm. And we would build the networks um, to allow uh, us to directly contract with providers and hospitals and others. Uh, especially if the Congress is going to take the action that they're suggesting by deeply cutting medical assistance here in the state of Minnesota. Isn't that going to put uh, Minnesota virtually bankrupt? Uh, I mean, we're going to have to increase state taxes immensely, are we not? If, it's uh, a $2 billion cut. Right. Um, that Out of a, what's, the, what's the yearly budget or the biennium budget for the state of Minnesota? $46 billion, give or it's take? It's in the mid-40s now, yeah. and that's just state-only dollars, not including federal dollars. It is going to be a real hit for the state's economy, uh, for our nursing homes, our hospitals, our clinics, all over the state of Minnesota. Um, I am committed to making sure that people who get their care uh, through Minnesota Care and medical assistance continue to do so. We can't walk away from people who are sick, from elderly people who are low income, from people with disabilities. We can't. That's not Minnesota's way. But we're going to have to make some very difficult decisions if we want to continue to afford to provide care for the people who are sick in our communities. Um, and that means, I think, exploring again our relationship with the health plans and with the vendors who provide care through uh, the contracting process. We're going to have to negotiate more strongly. We're going to have to consider how we're negotiating drug prices again. Um, and we're going to have to consider our relationship with the health plans um, if we want to make sure that our commitment 
to sick people in Minnesota is that they get care when they need it. Well, very thoughtful answers. A few more questions. They're about Minnesotans and politics becoming more polarized. Here's one from Bruce in Minneapolis. Well, I drive a truck in Minnesota and I get out into the small towns and I can vaguely understand what happened in the uh, last presidential election. Aaron running for governor as a St. Paul legislator. Is there something you can do to help persuade voters in the rural areas to vote for you? Well, That's always. a good question. It's a great question and people are talking a lot about um, what we describe as this urban-rural divide, mm -hmm. which is really being articulated, I think, by interest groups who would prefer to see Minnesotans divided. Exactly. Um, and it is uh, dangerous for us. Um, and it is not the way that we build our future together. Um, and but it's I not think something that uh, is normal in the history of Minnesota politics, at least as I view it. You are spot on about that. We have a long tradition of building coalitions across the state and recognizing that we have to share the benefits of our economy across the state so all our communities have opportunities, right? So we all have good schools. So tell Bruce, uh, how are you going to get those people out in the rural areas to cast a vote for Aaron? So Bruce should know that I grew up in a little town too. I grew up in a little town called Columbus, Wisconsin. Um, and I moved to Minnesota because I wanted to practice nursing at the University of Minnesota. So I know what it's like to grow up in a small town. I think it's important that we recognize that different parts of the state have different uh, issues that they're trying to confront and deal with. Um, it's my job to listen and not tell people what I think we should do, but to understand the lives that they're living, the challenges that they're facing, and then we need to work together to solve them. I've been fortunate in my 11 years to spend time all over the state of Minnesota, not just passing through and doing a press conference or a speech, but actually spending time in people's homes, in their barns and in their farms and in their combines, which I can now drive. Um, it has made, it has made me... You're very me popular, I'm sure, with the show in the rural areas. <laughs> yes, that's Spend right. Spend half a day doing this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I made it my business um, to learn about the state of Minnesota through Minnesotans, and they are my very best teachers. And it is through them that I have learned about our regional economies, our regional differences, our regional strengths. Um, and I, I spent a day in Melrose, Minnesota, after we lost the 2014 election, when everybody was talking about <coughs> we're very divided um, in the state of Minnesota by geography. So I went to Melrose, which is represented by Republicans. It's not a Democratic-leaning district by any stretch of the imagination. I spent the morning talking with um, people who do human services, um, local elected officials, city administrators, et cetera. Then we all had lunch at a tavern across the street, and I remember it was during Lent, so we all had fish sandwiches. And then we spent the afternoon at the dairy processing plant, and there had been a gentleman with us the whole way through, and he just wasn't engaging much in conversation, but he toured us through the dairy processing plant, and he lit up as he talked about the, the plant, the people who worked there, the work that they were doing. And at the end of it, when we were taking off our garb, because we were all dressed up like we were in surgery, I said, can we get a picture taken together? I just loved how you talked about your work here. And he said, do you know why I'm dressed in black today? And I said, I don't. And he said, because I had to spend my day with a Democrat. And I was really unhappy about it. But I have loved getting to know you. And let's get a picture taken together. That's great. I think that's how we do it. OK. William in St. Paul sent in a question that you, you've touched on and perhaps answered uh, already. But I'm going to read it anyway. As governor, how would Aaron meet the challenge of divisiveness? that has all but ruined democracy and made it nearly impossible to find bipartisan solutions to bipartisan challenges in Minnesota. I think the way I would view that is, tell us uh, what your experience has been in trying to work across the aisle to find solutions for the state, because you're a veteran legislator. Yeah, so I've had a, a fair amount of experience. Um, I had a little piece of legislation passed this past session. I'm in the legacy building dealing with art and creating an art app, um, because there's art all over the state of Minnesota and it is an economic driver, and it is a community builder, and I worked with the chair, um, Bob Gunther, on that piece of legislation and got it passed in into his bill. But I've worked on significant um, issues with Republicans, um, with Matt Dean, representative from the Dalwood area, mm -hmm. when we reinstated funding for general assistance medical care back in 2010. Um, that was a bipartisan effort, a really hard-fought bipartisan effort, and at the end of that, both Representative Dean and I were in the doghouse in our caucuses, uh, but we made it possible for people who made $8,000 a year or less to get coverage. Tremendous. We did that together. When I was the majority leader, I worked closely with the now Speaker Kurt Dowd, 
um, to make sure that we could get our work done on time. And we did that by essentially negotiating the amount of time we were going to spend on the major budget bills that had to come before the House for a full debate. Um, I wanted to make sure that the minority had their shot at making their case. And I also wanted to make sure that we got done on time and we did it in a civil way. And there are lots of small examples where that happens. Mm -hmm. We have to remember that our first job is to serve the people of Minnesota. And if we use every legislative session to knock the other side down and not focus on our future, Minnesotans are getting lost in that debate. And I want to bring us back to a kind of politics that is intended to improve people's lives, that allows us to do the work we need to do to prepare for the future. So our kids and grandkids want to live here and people from all over the world to bring their talent here to help us build the future of the state of Minnesota. Power to the people. Here's, a, uh, here's a, just a couple of uh, last questions and they're some, somewhat related. This is from Sarah. Uh, if elected governor, how will you be using social media to communicate with your voters? I am um, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter right now and I like social media because it is a way to understand people's support for things. But I will tell you, I don't tweet at four in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Yep. The, the lines are busy anyway. So I use it and I'm, I'm uh, you know, grateful for people who continue to push me on that platform. And the final question is from uh, Joan Hall Paulus and it's as follows. I know that you say it's important for us to tell our stories and I also know that you've spent a lot of time going all over the state of Minnesota. Have you developed a vision for our state out of those multitudes of stories that you've listened to? So I've been blessed with moments in my lifetime here where I have seen Minnesotans in large ways and small ways rise up to the challenge that they face. I remember being a transplant nurse and transplanting pancreases and they didn't always succeed but we persisted in doing it until we got it right. The University of Minnesota is the creator of the heart-lung machine, uh, uh, an innovation that nobody imagined until they decided it was time to find a better way. That is a part of who we are. We're inventors, we're innovators. Um, we like to think outside the box, but we don't do that very much in our politics anymore. I had a chance to have a drink with a guy named Tom Galach, who lives up in Aurora, Minnesota. And he is nearly 80 years old. And we were uh, in Aurora on the 3rd of July, this is probably three or four years ago, at the American Legion. And the mines on the Iron Range were starting to close down. Um, and we had come through that hard recession in 2008 and 2009 and he was worried about the future of that community. I listened to him talk about the things that he was going to do to make sure that Aurora and the Iron Range thrived into the future because he believed he had a part in it. He believed it was up to him and not him alone but to work with other people in the community to do that. That story is the story I hear all over the state of Minnesota. Erica Bradich starting a coffee shop because the lumber yard that she works in right now might be closing down. The new mayor in Fergus Falls excited about the riverfront development. The women in New London using art and economic development to tell a story about protecting the prairies and building their economy and, and doing education for their kids in a way that they believe in. Minnesotans are showing us that if we give them our attention, they will show us the way to build our bright future. Um, we should be participating, listening to them, and helping out a little bit, and that's what I want to do. And I have one final question, an issue that came before the legislature again this session had to do with vouchers. Uh, can you tell me what, uh, what the details of that were and what your position actually was? Yeah, so there was a, a more complicated sort of tax policy voucher scheme that was contemplated in the legislature, but it, essentially it would send uh, public dollars to private schools through the tax code. Um, and we've had this debate before in Minnesota. From my perspective, we need strong public schools all over the state of Minnesota, not just because we want to make sure our kids all over the state of Minnesota are getting an excellent education, and we do believe in that. I think Minnesotans across the state believe in that. But when we think about communities across the state of Minnesota, an anchor for communities is a school. Families are not going to go to a community and set up their home if they don't believe their kids are going to get a good education. People are not going to go to a community um, and start a business if they don't think their kids are going to get a good education. So from my perspective, our first public dollars should be going to our public schools to make sure that they are adequate and excellent all across the state of Minnesota. 
and the voucher provision that we entertained this last session is a diversion from that well, and a distraction. Well, the schools are chronically underfunded, so you're taking away monies that could otherwise go to public education. Would That's you right. not buy a voucher system? Yes, we would be undermining our public schools, and if you, you I've been to lots of schools across the state of Minnesota, um, and there are some schools that are in need of repair. They need up, they need upgrades in terms of their equipment. I was in a school in Cook County um, a couple of years ago, and the chemistry lab there looked like the chemistry lab that I used when I was in high school. They need some help, right? So first dollars, our dollars, our public dollars, um, should go to our public schools, period. Erin, uh, I know since November you've been hitting the highways and byways. You've been all over the state, and I assume that that process is going to continue. But having said that, I want to wish you the best of luck. I want to thank you for coming in and sharing your time with Democratic Visions. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Next up, Jeff Strait welcomes the storytelling team that has been winning kudos and fans around the country. Howard Lieberman and Lauren Nimi are Minnesotans. Right now, they're just outside our studio in one of the fine art galleries that helped make the Bloomington Civic Plaza one gem of a place to visit and run a city. Where do you think Howard is? I don't know. He's, he's on his way. He's, he's lost. Lauren Nimi trades in advising clients on effective messaging and lobbying for those savvy enough to, to hire him. Howard Lieberman, Lauren's partner in storytelling, has been a corporate attorney and a legal profession headhunter. And, and it sounds kind of scary. Excuse me. Yeah. Have you seen Howard? You mean Howard Lieberman, the really smart guy? Yeah. I wanted them to talk about their upcoming gig at the Minnesota Fringe Festival. Lauren and Howard will team with blues singer Mari Harris and activist Rose McGee to take measure of the summer of love and outrage back in 1967. No, I haven't seen him. Oh. A half century ago, Vietnam War protests and race riots raged on city streets as another America danced with the age of Aquarius and Lawrence Welk. 1967, the theatrical, cross-talking about the then and the now, about 1967, about 2017. Rarig Center's Arena Theater from August 4th through the 12th. We found Howard in the Inez Greenberg Gallery. I hustled both back to our own studio to, to learn more. Well, guys, we're, we're running out of time. So 1967, before the assassinations, the Kennedys, Dr. King, the shootings at Kent State, and Malcolm Jackson X, State, Malcolm X, certainly. There was, on some level, a certain trust in our society as a whole that we had institutions that were of, by, and for the people. And that one was more conservative, that one was more liberal. The conservative was your Main Street businessman, the, the liberal was more the union person. And through that period, in particular, in the late 60s, um, culminating with the, the, the King assassination in many ways, we, had, we, be, we developed a societal cynicism that I think continued for a long time, began to wane, and today is as bad as it ever has been. So from my perspective, I mean, what ha you know, you have the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and you know, you have Johnson's war on poverty, and what happens is, is that in the immediate, in the, in the African American, in the black neighborhoods, in the Latino neighborhoods, in the Native American, you know, reservations, it, it has no immediate visible effect. And people say, well, wait a minute, what, what did we struggle for, right? And, and at the point where the rage boils over and mm -hmm. we begin to have rioting, uh, we say black lives mattered then and we didn't learn the lesson. Right. And that is, in fact, the situation that we're, we're in a situation now where, where, once again, you know, black lives matter, where the frustration about inequality and the frustration about race relations does boil over. And, it's, and it comes down to an incident. You know, there's a particular incident where the police overreact or the police badly react. You know, and we go from there, whether it be Rodney King or whether it be, you know, Ferguson or whether it be Philando Castile here, you know, the, and people go, why? You know, people who are sort of in that suburban cocoon uh, for who have not experienced sort of that the, uh, systemic prejudice, 
and systemic denial of opportunity. For them, they say, why are these people doing that as opposed to saying, how did, what well, I always say is, why did it take so long? <laughs> well, in, in fact, when I was a, a, a kid growing up in Chicago, the, the projects, as they were called, were these enormous concrete prisons on the south side. And I remember when the riots started and the burnings started, my own relatives using that as a justification for saying, see, these people are just animals. And look what they're doing to their own homes. And, you know, what happens is we oppress people for so long, but something provokes and then they rise up. And again, every, instead of saying, oh, my God. How do we correct the problem? They go, the, these the, people. The root. <laughs> it's always these people. These, those people. Those these people, people. Those people. Whatever. Yeah. Never these people who own the buildings, who, who run the grocery stores, who, who, who make the policy decisions, these people who put them in the, the high-rise towers, right? No, they never ask the question, what, what can we do to change this? What have we done that wrought this? There is very little introspection. So in 1967, we're trying to find those moments and through our stories, tell the tales of what those moments were like how they impacted us individually, right. how they impacted society, and um, look to the audience and say, on some level, I guess the audience is out here, I'd say on yeah, some level, level right. um, hear this, feel this. You know, w without being explicit about it, you know, we're, we're, we are saying, you know, how have things changed or not changed? In, in fact, one could argue that nothing at all has changed. Yeah, yeah. The reboot of 1967 with McGee, Harris, Lieberman, and Nimi runs from August 4th through 12th at Rarig Center on the West Bank. Visit fringefestival.org for showtimes and tickets. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Democratic Visions is handcrafted by volunteers from Eden Prairie, Hopkins, Minnetonka, Edina, and Bloomington. Watch us on select cable systems and on our YouTube channel. This is Carol Sundstrom.